I want to say a huge thanks to uh, Leadership Atlanta to, for having me here. This is a really exciting opportunity. It's really great to be part of something the inaugural year, and this is a really enterprising summit, a really great idea. Um, it's an honor to be here to kick off this session on the future of cities, and in particular, it's really an honor to be here with my esteemed co-panelists who are just fabulous and wonderful. So um, with that, I'm just really excited. Um, let me put this down for a second. So we're here today to talk about big ideas, big with a capital B and a capital I, uh, ideas that can address solutions for the future of Atlanta, how to get people here, how to get people to stay here, but also for cities and regions generally. And a couple years ago, I stumbled upon a big one in this realm. That idea led to this book, The End of the Suburbs. At this point, I sort of feel obliged to issue an apology. Uh, most Americans live in the suburbs. Most Atlantans live in the suburbs. I realize that, but this is not... I'm not being deliberately provocative, nor am I foreshadowing doom and gloom here. Quite the contrary. Uh, what I write about in the book and what I'm talking about today is a sea change that is really happening across our landscape in terms of how and where we want to live and how and where we arrange ourselves. That change is uh, basically a shift towards urbanism, or what I call downtownification. And it's happening in cities, but it's also happening in suburbs. And in fact, some of the most dramatic changes are happening in our suburbs today. Uh, you know, this is really everywhere. It's in Skokie, it's in Soho, it's in Cincinnati, it's in San Diego, uh, and it's a really transformational shift. So my colleagues are gonna talk a little bit, they'll drill down in, into talking about Atlanta in particular, but I thought I would give kind of a nationwide overview of this shift, this shift which has tremendous economic implications, and it really presents a lot of opportunity. So before I talk about the changes, it's really important to understand why they're happening. This is Levittown, the very first post-war suburb. It's in the history books. So a lot of people may have heard about it. It's where I come from, up in New York. Um, the American suburbs were basically a really great idea when they were born, and they worked really wonderfully for a really long time. But they started out as one thing, and then they changed into something else. And that something else has kind of stopped working for a lot of people on a lot of levels. The easiest way to understand this change in one sentence is to look at it through the lens of um, popular culture. So if you think about it, the suburbs in the US kind of started out as wonder years. And they ended up like the suburb in the Showtime series Weeds, which is you know, basically to say we went from these lively little villages with their own downtowns to the subdivision plus strip mall plus office park model that was very easy to replicate and was then sort of cut and pasted across the landscape. And then that went on steroids during the housing boom um, everywhere, here in Atlanta, everywhere across the whole country. Uh, to use another television reference, I think you could safe, safe to say that the suburbs kind of jumped the shark. This has led to a number of problems. I'll focus on two big ones just quickly because you have to understand what the solution is trying to fix, so you need to understand the problems. The first is that a sprawling landscape has led to long commutes and heavy traffic for a lot of people. This is not news to anybody who lives in the suburbs. It's probably not news to anyone who lives here, uh, nor does anyone need a lesson on it, but just raise your hand if this looks familiar. <laughs> okay, there we go. How about this? this? This actually is Atlanta. I will say that I had absolutely no problem. I breezed in from the airport, so I haven't seen it yet, but I'm told that this is sometimes the case here. Uh, I can also, you can rest assured that the, the worst tale from the commuting trenches that I heard was not from uh, Atlanta or the East Coast. It was actually from the Inland Empire of California, which is a sprawling region east of Los Angeles and Orange Counties. I talked to a woman there who was a teacher who lived in Temecula, California, which is about 70 miles from where she had to be. And to get there on time, she had to get up at 3.50 in the morning, leave her house at 4 a.m. in her sweatpants, and only then would she be guaranteed that the ride would be an hour and 15 minutes. If she left any minute after 4 a.m., it would be much longer, up to three hours. But she would get there so early, it would be 5.15 in the morning. So the only thing to do was to, t to sleep under her desk until it was time for class to begin, or time to get ready. Uh, in the ladies' room where she brought her flat iron and everything. So she told me she felt like George Costanza in the famous episode of Seinfeld where he sleeps under, her desk, under his desk. A second big problem with this is that it, uh, this arrangement puts people really far apart from each other. I spoke to one woman who lives in a 6,000 square foot house outside of Chicago 
And she told me, it, it dawned on her one day that after living there for 10 years, she had never been inside any of her neighbor's kitchens. And that wasn't really what she expected when she moved to the suburbs, but that was the, her reality. In another community in New Jersey, I talked to people there where um, the parents, the houses were so sp spread so far apart and the lots were so big that the, none of the parents really wanted their kids to trick or treat on Halloween because the kids would get exhausted, it was too, far, too great a distance for the little ones, and they wouldn't get as much candy, of course, at that, those low density levels, and it was dark and not well lit. So instead, they came up with another alternative approach. They decided to get all the parents together and drive to the K-8 school and park in tailgate formation, and the kids trick-or-treated from car to car. <laughs> it worked really well. They actually loved it. But it really just goes to show you how we've lost that kind of close proximity to one another so much that this community had to literally create it out of cars. And actually, that's an easy metric. You know, I think an economist, a smart economist, might look at the ease of trick-or-treating as a, I'm sure there's a correlation with community, so that's something to think about. <laughs> so instead, imagine trick-or-treating in a place like this. This is an aerial shot at the same scale of a neighborhood in Maryland, an urbanized suburb called Kentlands. Imagine how much loot you would get if you trick-or-treated here. You'd definitely need a much bigger bag. So this distance and separation has led to a lot of dissatisfaction, and that's been well chronicled over the years. These days, one of the best ways to take the temperature of that is, of course, to go to Twitter. And I did an interesting experiment. When you search for the hashtag, I hate the suburbs, you get volumes of tweets on Twitter. You get a ton of material, including this really funny Twitter feed by a woman uh, who tweets out of Charlotte under the name Cul-de-sac. <laughs> it says, I'll try to read it, I live in the suburbs. All my friends stay are stay-at-home moms who read people and watch Oprah. I tweet to keep from going insane. P people Magazine is very good. My company publishes it. So. <laughs> Uh, anyway, when you search, I love the suburbs, you get a single tweet. In all of Twitter's billions of tweets, you get a single one. I tried this many times, and it always had the same result. So try it at home. It's, it's sort of interesting, and it rarely fails. So enough with the negative. There's some really, really good news here, and that is that the building and development industry is, is really listening and seeing that there's a need, and more importantly, an underserved market for livelier communities that solve some of these problems. Communities where it's possible to go to a vibrant Main Street, to bump into people they know, to have that cliche good cup of coffee where it's not very far away and in some cases right around the corner. The suburbs are urbanizing or downtownifying all over the place. There is a race for place going on. This is Kentlands, the slide I mentioned a couple um, slides ago, the community in Maryland. And this is a, a, it was an experimental community when it went up in 1993. Um, it was one of the first so-called new urbanist communities, which are communities that are built around a traditional, more urban blueprint. So it has a mixture of townhouses and regular houses. It has apartments. It has a downtown and a couple gathering spots all over the place. And it's been a financial success since it opened in 1993. But for a long time, there just weren't that many of these communities. It's not overstating things to say that in America, you, you kind of have two, you, for so long, you had two choices of where you wanted to live. You could live in a big city or you could live in a cul-de-sac. And there was very little in between. And that's finally starting to change. This is School Street. This is a development in Libertyville, Illinois, which is about 30 miles north of Chicago. Uh, this is a new community of about 26 homes. They're right next to each other, as you can see. They have porches. Um, these homes are located right next to the main street in Libertyville, so these people can just walk to this thriving downtown that has bars that are open until 3 a.m. and lots of restaurants and other things. Uh, this was developed by a developer, John McClendon, who used to build Sprawl, and he thought people might be interested in something like this. He built this in the middle of the financial crisis, and he sold out within a year. The local news called it a, quote, aberration. He's now doing bigger developments just like this in Skokie, Illinois, and in Steamboat Springs, Colorado. This is Belmar, uh, which is a walkable downtown that has been built on the grounds of an old uh, giant shopping mall in Lakewood, Colorado. My colleague Ellen Dunham Jones, who we'll hear from a little later, has done a lot of work chronicling the retrofitting of suburbia, taking some of these old icons and turning them into these lively pedestrian villages. Um, this community is doing really well also. 
The void that these communities are trying to fill becomes really obvious when you look at the marketing language that the builders and developers are using. So this is a, a community called the Village at Leesburg in Leesburg, Virginia. This is what's called a lifestyle center. It's very kind of high-rise oriented. There's uh, retail on the ground floor, and it's, it's really into promoting the fact that it's a walking community. So you know, the website promotes things like it asks provocatively, have you met your neighbors? Uh, it, it touts the, quote, exciting mainstream in environment. These developers are promoting these things the way five or ten years ago they would have promoted a three-story foyer. This is happening here in Atlanta, too. Atlanta's at the forefront of many of these trends. This is Glenwood Park, which is a lively city neighborhood about two miles from the center of downtown Atlanta. Some of you probably know it. We'll hear from Catherine Kelly, its developer, in a little while. But people here are basically trading 35-mile commutes for something better. Uh, during my research, I came across an interview with a resident who said that in the first six months of living there, he lost 10 pounds, and he didn't change his diet, he didn't change his exercise. All that was was that he started walking to get to more places than he ever did before. So um, that's one benefit. You can't wear shoes like this in a community like that. <laughs> this is Bradley Cooper in uh, the movie Silver Linings Playbook, because at this point in any presentation, I find it's always good to show Bradley Cooper. But <laughs> the point is, uh, this neighborhood that this movie was filmed in is a neighborhood outside of Philadelphia called Drexel Hill. It happens to be where my father grew up, and it also happens to be where our next uh, speaker, Chris Leinberger, grew up. Drexel Hill is in a first ring inner suburb of Philadelphia, and it was built on a different blueprint. It was more urban, it was built at a smaller, more human scale. It has all of the elements that all of the new communities I spoke about are trying to replicate. We did it well back then, and these kinds of communities, these older suburbs that have these kinds of DNA built into them, are doing well, and many people think these are gonna be where people wanna live in the future. And we're already seeing a lot of them in many different cities start to come back pretty strongly. A lot of people think that this is where millennials in particular are gonna wanna live. Earlier this year, the New York Times <clears throat> did a big story and it coined what it called hipsterbia, talking about a lot of these inner ring suburbs that offer this kind of walkable community more naturally and saying that these were the future. I grew up in a suburb that would actually probably be called a hipsterbia now. I grew up in a town called Media, Pennsylvania, which is 12 miles southwest of Philadelphia. And it has a lot of ingredients that you don't really see in suburbs or small towns anymore. It has, as you can see, a trolley. This is not for tourists. People use it to get to work every day. Uh, it has a really packed Main Street. Bars there are open and packed longer and later than the bars on my block in New York City. It gets quite wild at times. <laughs> uh, there is a big courthouse that takes up four uh, square blocks. There's a vaudeville theater that's been restored. This is media right here um, on Wednesday nights in the summertime. They run a program called Dining Under the Stars where all the restaurants, they close the street to traffic, all the restaurants put tables and chairs outside and hundreds of people come. You can't get a table, it's sometimes hard to walk on the sidewalk. This is not what conventional suburbs look like on Wednesday nights in the summertime, but this is what some urban burbs can look like on Wednesday nights in the summertime. Media is thriving, the mayor tells me the biggest problem is the lack of parking. Urbanization has come to our cities as well in a major, major way. Uh, this is Providence, Rhode Island. You don't hear about Providence that often, but it, like so many other cities, is in the middle of a, a major uh, revitalization. This is Baltimore's revitalized Inner Harbor. Uh, this started really with the opening of Camden Yards, the, the baseball field, in the mid-90s. And actually, the opening of baseball fields is also a really good metric for our move towards urbanization of an informal survey of 23 ballparks that have been opened since, since Camden Yards. All but one or two have been opened in the downtown and mostly in the very core downtown, whereas they used to open uh, outside of cities near the big highway interchanges that were easy to get to. And this is Atlantic Station in downtown Atlanta on the site of the former Atlantic Steel Mill, the largest brownfield redevelopment project in the US. Atlanta has really been a leader in urban renewal. Uh, this is the Atlanta Beltline, the most comprehensive revitalization project ever in Atlanta, probably, and one of the largest in the US. Uh, I don't know if he knew I was gonna show this slide, but we'll hear from Paul Morris from the Beltline in a little bit. And this is the High Line in New York. From the Beltline to the High Line, from Cincinnati to San Diego, these urban redevelopment projects are a bloom everywhere. At the same time, we at Fortune track the moves of big business as, to sh as an indication of where the world is going. And we have seen big corporate icons like Walmart and Target 
even PetSmart, all these retailers are experimenting with smaller formats to move into the cities because they're following where the wealth is going. It's also happening with big corporate headquarters. One of the big sort of pillars of our suburban expansion was the move in the 70s and 80s uh, of big companies into suburban office parks. You see them everywhere. Companies are starting to leave them and move back into downtowns. We're seeing this happen anecdotally in a few places, but they're very big companies and very big cities. United Airlines in Chicago, Sarah Lee, which is now called uh, Hillshire Brands, also in Chicago. Just last week, I was at the new headquarters of Panasonic in the US, which recently moved from uh, Secaucus, which is very much a sprawl-oriented suburb of, of New York City in New Jersey, to Newark. It doesn't get grittier than Newark, and the CEO of Panasonic, Joe Taylor, is particularly proud of that. I said, I said to him, you know, you're part of a trend here, and he said, yeah, but it's easy to move to Chicago. It's easy to move to New York. I dare anybody to try to move to Newark. He really said that. <laughs> but he is, and he's really excited about it. One of the biggest, to me, the biggest proof of the suburban to urban migration comes in the activity of Toll Brothers, which is the big uh, home builder that's probably best known for, it really rose to fame on the wings of the suburban luxury mega home. This is what it did, and it benefited hugely in the housing boom. This is one of Toll Brothers' latest projects. This is a building in New York City in the Dumbo neighborhood of Brooklyn that stands for Down Under the Manhattan Bridge Overpass. It's gritty, it's edgy, it's totally chic. Apartments in this building go for 400,000 to 2 million, and they sold out in a year. This is the new skyscraper that Toll Brothers is building on 28th and Park Avenue South. This building, when it went up, was, called, was nicknamed by the real estate press in New York the Fortress of Glassitude. It now has a new name. It just came out a couple weeks ago that Toll is going to call this Sky Couture, which to me says a whole lot of things. Apartments in this building, condos, are going to sell from $1 million to $10 million. But that's not even Toll Brothers' ex most expensive listing in the New York City market. It has a penthouse condominium for sale on 65th and Lexington in the Upper East Side for $20 million. The CEO is bought, he can't believe that, that he's got stuff for sale in New York City for $20 million. He's as shocked as anyone, but it's happening. Toll Brothers City Living is the one of the company's best performing divisions, and they now have 30 or more buildings that are either in the works or open in New York City. To me, this is so really exemplary of the sea change that's happening. You know, Toll and others, I mean, Toll's bread and butter is the suburbs, and yet it's doing these, ma these big time investments in New York City. Companies like Toll and Pulte and KB and all the other big home builders that are involved in this trend don't do anything because it's good for us, because it's better for us not to have long commutes, because it's better for the environment or because it's more sustainable. They do it for one reason, and that's because of money. They do it because they see a tremendous business opportunity here. The cities and regions that understand this more metamorphosis and this change and get it are going to be the ones that get the talent and the people and the companies and the investment and the economic growth for the future. Atlanta has been a huge leader in this already, and so now the challenge is going to be to kind of seize on that momentum and to continue to move it forward and to continue to get more of it to create and maximize even more opportunity because a lot of it is coming our way. So I want to thank you for our, your attention, and I'm really delighted to turn the stage over to my colleagues. Thank you.